Thank you, Father. Barados daya da balega yando. Mambra da bashande repte bale bayido ba. Macro dos da balembro no mon shande bale yada ba. Lega baba shanda do bale brande bosanda rap da bale brodo gayada. Ha. Jasanda barabdo boshande rep de bele boyando Manda robbo so bali gabale brodo boshanda robdo boshanda rep de bale Marado bagabali brondo boson de libra de boshanda rep de bale brono Mande subra de vayanda rep de ba thank you father Nothing can stop your intentions Nothing can hinder your counsel Nothing can stop your intentions. Father, I thank you for your word that is bringing transformation, alignment, deliverance, yes, into the lives of the people. I thank you that this is the day where you're speaking forth. And you're calling forth men and women who have the ears and the hearts to receive this thing so their life can indeed walk in the authority of your intentions for their day. We honor you, Father. We bless your name. We glorify you. Have your way. Nothing this morning will stop or hinder or frustrate your counsel. You will be glorifying the life of your people. Your will will find inroad and expression. Hallelujah. Friends, my apologies. <laughs> I don't know what happened. The computer just froze. In the midst of that powerful words that we were just laying as a foundation, the computer, everything just froze. <clears throat> but I give thanks to God because I know those are just one of the, you know, the lies of the enemy to try to, you know, stop you or hinder you from doing what you need to do. And we face that every day. So that's, that's not a new thing. We're just praying that God will give us resources, you know, to invest in, alternative you know equipment so that the moment one stop the other continues because these words are rich they are powerful we need to invest into this thing well as we were saying earlier on i think it's important that i go back to that scripture because that scripture seemed to have you know uh, uh steer something in the spirit and the enemy of course doesn't want you know that that scripture you know to you know to go out because like i said just as i was about to you know start the broadcast this morning the lord drew my attention to the scripture and of course this is just basically to lay a foundation as we continue to deal with issues of why we need to respond to amen god's heart god's desire god's you know uh, calling for our lives for this season as we continue to deal with the issues of separating yes the profane from the holy you know, the enemy, of course, doesn't want these things to be out there. But there is nothing the enemy can do because nothing can shut my voice. Nothing. We will continue to do. I can promise you that. We will continue to do what we need to do for you to have amen, the currency of heaven. For you to have the, the current proclamations of heaven. We'll go back to that scripture again. So once again, if you're joining me, welcome. All right. This is our... our if you will, part two of today's live broadcast. The, the first one, we were just about 30 minutes into the broadcast. It shuts down. All right. So uh, today, we, of course, we'll continue to deal with the dynamics of the kingdom. Today is our part 10 on this series called, you know, Occupying Till Christ's Return. And we have been looking into what is known as uh, uh, Caleb's Paradigm. We've been dealing with the issues of looking at <clears throat> looking at Caleb amen as an instrument you know as as you know as a value system as you know as an arrowhead of prophetic leadership in terms of developing longevity in the fulfillment of God's intention but while we were on that while we were introducing that God drew my attention to Hebrews 12 and I'm going to go back to it since the devil doesn't want me to talk about Hebrews 12, let's go back to it and then I'll go into um, other things that we want to deal with in terms of Caleb. And I believe this speaks into the nature of Caleb. Alright? Because of course that's what we're looking at in Caleb. What gave him that, 
if you will, sense of hope, that sense of courage, determination to continue to wait until he received what was promised after 85 years. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, a high density of amen, witnesses, let us throw off everything. And I remember emphasizing on that word, let us throw off everything. You see, if we don't have a sense of vision where we're going, what God is requiring, requiring and demanding from us, we, won't, we will not learn to throw off things. There are things in our life that we should throw off that don't matter, that will hinder us from running the race because that's the context here. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. The sin that so easily entangles. And all of this, amen, speaks into all kinds of dimension. Relationship, you understand? connection you know the condition of hearts agendas all of the things desires and passions that are not in line with the will of god those are the scenes and i began to you know highlight you know scenes of the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes and the pride of life and i remember saying those three scenes captures all kinds of scenes within the lives of men all right, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. If you want to win big with God, you've got to deal with those three things. And it's something we have to deal with consciously. We cannot stumble into these things. We have to consciously address them. All right? It says, let us run with perseverance, endurance race. That when all kinds of things are, have been programmed and positioned along the path, for you to trip over and fall so that you you stop running the bible says we must endure with perseverance the race that is marked out for us that race is a calling it's a vision and they say we have to persevere we have to be focused we have to be determined let us it's an injunction is an exaltation to the corporate body let us with perseverance run the race marked out for us and then they exalt us again they say let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith and then they told us why because he himself lived from that order they says for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty of Yahweh. Hallelujah. You see why we say Jesus is the pattern. Christ is the pattern. He is the standard in everything that we do. Amen, friends. So this is just an encouragement to somebody as we go into looking at some very important concepts about Caleb. Let's quickly go into some of the things that we're dealing with. All right? We've been talking about the principle of occupying. And the Lord has been showing us the various strategies, keynotes, key points, highlights that we must, amen, understand and really give attention to in other i'm sure everybody listening to me want to remain want to remain want to stay want to continue on the path of god's divine intention nobody wants to live their christian life and then after let's say 20 years or 30 years if the lord tarries then they decide well i think i've lived long enough walking this christian race L let me just go and do my own thing now once you come to the Lord, it's no longer about your desire, your ways, your will, your whatever. It's now, amen. In fact, Paul said, the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and died for me. The moment you come to the Lord, amen, your old life ceases to influence you. You come into a new life. You come into a new belief system. 
You come into a new culture, into a new value system. Your life is now being defined and ordered, amen, through the government of heaven, through the government of God. So we're, we're in this for a long haul. We're in this, amen, till eternity. I hope you understand that living your life as a Christian does not end here on earth. It moves into, amen, the world to come. It moves into the age to come. Hallelujah. This is how powerful these things are. So we cannot treat this thing with levity and treat it as if this is just a contract for five years. And after five years, you can disannul the contract. This is not a contract for 10 years. This is a covenant that we are call, called to enter. When we enter into that covenant, we live the rest of our life the way God wants it. You know, Christianity ought to be a reflection of marriage. Now, when you enter into it, you're supposed to enter into it for life. But you agree with me that that is not the mindset of many. And that's the same attitude people show in marriage, the same attitude people show in their work with God. I will journey as long as it suits my narrative. I will follow as long as, you understand? Yes, it, it benefits me. Don't they say in marriage, for better, for worse? You see, because the, the God who gave us marriage is the same God who called us into the ecclesia. So, you want to understand how the church ought to function, you should look at a working marriage. But we live in a day where people say, no, 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 I cannot surrender, I cannot submit my life to you because I don't believe in what you do. I don't believe in you. I want to do my own thing. We don't have the same interests. You have a different interest. And what's the interest? You have an interest of God. Somebody does not have the interest of God. I want to live my life the way I want to live it. But God cannot force you. These are the issues that we are dealing with. So when we come, that's why Christianity is not for babies. Just like marriage is not for babies. It's not for sex. It's not for beauty. It's not looking for a way out. You know, this guy can, because I've suffered with my parents, now I'm looking for a guy who's got money. Or well, I'm looking for, you know, a girl who's got God knows what. It's not for our own selfish interests. Just as the church was not designed for a selfish interest, marriage is not designed for selfish interests. Well, how do we practice it both today? We practice it for our own selfish gain. And that's why, amen, in every five marriage, they say three, amen, collapses. And I'm facing that because that's the reality of life. You cannot force people to go to where they don't want to go. We've got to understand what it means to live within the context of a life that is totally surrendered to God. If your life is not surrendered to God and you're searching for something that you can gain, you can get. Like I said yesterday, some people come to God, all right? And all they want about God is, I just want the prosperity part of you. No, some say, I just want the healing part of you. I just want the deliverance part of you. And I just want the, this part of you. I just want that. They don't want all of him. And that's not a relationship. That is not what, amen, Christ came to teach us and show us. If we want to serve the Lord, we have to serve him wholeheartedly. And that's what we saw about Caleb. The Bible says Caleb, amen, he served God wholeheartedly. He has a different spirit. And the scripture defines what a different spirit is, amen. The Bible says, amen, he, 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 he served the Lord whole. There's no part of his life that was kept for himself. Everything was offered on the altar. offered on the altar so let us understand what am i doing i'm only setting the standard we've lost the standard we've lost the values of the things of god everybody today will tell you i'm a christian including people who live their life in such a wayward life and they'll tell you, i'm a christian i myself i'm a child of god i'm like okay god creates all things but if you're a christian when you come to the Lord, they clean you up. Your values change. Your preferences change. Your desires change. You cannot be a Christian. You still want amen, something that is alien to the nature, to the values of Christ. 
this thing with chipping it we've made it look as if it's a child's play no god is restoring amen the values of his divine intention is restoring the ways of his kingdom is bringing us back to the order hallelujah where we are able to locate heaven's intention that's why we've been talking about prophetic gps so we know the pathway we understand the direction of god we know where he's leading us into we are not confused so the issues of understanding the dynamics of the kingdom is very very important Are you following? Are you listening, friends? This is not where I do it the way I want to do it. No. There is a divine pattern. There's a divine yastic. There's a divine standard. There's an organogram that we are following. Hallelujah. I thank God that I've not lost my edge. The enemy had tried so many times for me to lose my edge. To lose my arrowhead. To lose the core, you know, essence of my calling and ministry. I thank God for God's mercy that I'm not just a Christian just loafing around. No. I have a voice in the earth. I have a voice in the earth and this voice will continue yes, to resound even within areas and places that people don't want to hear. Hallelujah. So, the scripture is giving us a very powerful concept. So we are just tracking some things here that I thought will give us understanding and give us some blueprint in terms of what the Lord is demanding of us. Okay, let's quickly go to uh, uh, um, Numbers 14. As you can see it on your screen, Numbers 14. And then we'll quickly deal with some highlights and then I'll be done for this morning. But so far so good. I hope you are working you know in in understanding of what we're talking about i hope some of the things that we've said is clear because i really want it to be clear i don't want you know this sound to be to be muffled to you know to be fuzzled i don't want you to be confused there's no ambiguity in, in what we're talking about there has to be clarity there has to be precision in understanding you have to know the standard the requirement of god you have to know the demand of god for your life for your you know spirituality for your walk with him Abraham walk with me he said if you're gonna walk with God you really must really have the stamina you must have amen the determination you cannot afford to be distracted walking with the Lord and it's for that reason we are we looked at that scripture again maybe I should go back to it because that scripture seemed to be saying something go read it if you have your Bible open it if you don't have your Bible with you or you have it on your phone check it now all right Hebrews 12 1 Right? and 2 says therefore since we are surrounded by such a, gr a great cloud of witnesses let us throw off throw it off everything throw off everything that can hinder and the sin that can so easily entangle let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us they say we must fix our eyes on Jesus who is the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith he said for the joy that was set before him he endured the cross scorning his shame when you bear the, the cross the shame but the cross is what brings you to glory there's no glory without the cross There is no glory without the cross. If you hate the cross, you hate God's glory. I hope you understand that amen, the cross was the, was, the, was the pathway that Jesus went amen, into glory. And there's a shame. But in that shame in the cross, there is glory. So this is a message that if you have been taught to to hear to listen to drink from certain cup you won't like this kind of a message but i can assure you 101 percent that this is the truth nothing but the truth there are those who want to create their own paths to get to god there are those who have created their own path of how to get to god how to get to the things of god only for them to realize that sorry there's a point you're going to get to they'll say sorry no there's no road here they think now they're on the right path they think they're doing the right thing there's a way that cement right onto a man you're going to get to you know that point they will tell you road close 
have you been on that kind of a road before where you just keep going you just keep going you just keep going and you're noticing the same but what's going on but the road still look okay you're going only for you to get to the end you just see you know x you continue is a ditch have you been to south places before because you've ignored all road sign you've ignored everything everybody's saying you you're bent on doing your own thing there's a way that symmetry right onto a man but the end is destruction so we're tracking a man why are we tracking caleb why are we tracking caleb because in caleb we find a value system we find something highly important that we need in order to be able to finish in order to remain in order to occupy our space and in order to continue to advance and not to be afraid we find in caleb the ability yes to remain to to continue that no matter what happens all right that we are not defeated by time we find that in caleb caleb said 40 40 years ago 45 years ago i was promised this hill country now i'm 85 he went to jo joshua he said i need you to give me this place 45 years ago i was promised i mean 45 years is enough time to forget 45 years is enough time to look for an alternative hello 45 years is enough to forget Sarah and go into, you know, a guy because you just want to have a child. Hello? Some people are more interested, you understand, in the victory, in the manifestation than the process of the manifestation. Just give me. That's why people at some point, believers at some point, they will amen, forget the principles and the values of Christianity, if you will, the kingdom life, and they will go to the other side. They will go to the dark world. They will go to you know areas of compromise just to get what they want. No, I must get. I must get it. If if God cannot give to me after forty five years, ah, huh, Satan can give it to me. Uh, the abelis can give it to me you know the sangoma can give it to me you know the witch can give it to me the you know the somebody in the government can give it to me i, I, I rather settle for that because i want it everybody has got one why must i be waiting when you have that kind of a mindset as a christian you will at some point backslide you will at some point compromise because something on the inside of you is about getting it not about the process of god of getting it see there are powerful statement i've just made now even the world teach you the concept of delay gratification we don't have it again I want it and it must be by fire or force. I want it by fire or force. I, I must get it. I must build that God knows what. Even in the things of God we do that. How many times have people used Bab Babylonic system in trying to build what they call is for God? Then the Tower of Babel, people were building that thing to want to reach God and God still came down amen, and scattered them, judged them. They wanted to reach a dimension where they can tap into, you know, the power of the host of heaven. God came down and judged them. So you see, the end does not justify the means. As a message, many don't want to hear in the body of Christ, particularly leaders. You see a man with five, six, maybe 12 people in a gathering doing what God will have them do waiting for the next season that god will promote them somebody will come and talk them out of that thing and say is this what you're going to be doing is this what god has called you to do where two or three are guided is that ministry if ministry to one person is not a ministry the ministry to a thousand person is not a ministry because you miss what ministry is all about they said the rest is not for the swift so there are all kinds of things that our message, amen, is, 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 is challenging, is exposing, that we have embraced into our life. 
Nobody is saying anybody should be, you know, mediocre. Should be lazy, should not walk. But you're walking, you're doing your best. But the time of increase has not come. Whatever that means. Because we all have different definitions for increase, for success, for prosperity. <laughs> and God promised, he said, I will supply all your needs. And God supply our needs based on the seasons of our life, of our growth, of our development, of our prophetic amen, expressions in the earth. There are things they will not give to me now because they know that, all right, I have not grown. I have not come into certain understanding or certain reality. Whatever God is looking for that I need to know and have, amen, in this season for them to add to me. If I don't get there, it could be in my walk with the Lord, amen. It could be in my sense of, you know, I, you know, I don't know. Whatever it is, that's why we walk with God daily. As we please Him, He promotes us. The promotion comes from Him. But if you don't know that, you will live your life under the pressures of men. Telling you you're a failure. Telling you what you do can never reach anybody. I told you about, you know, how Billy Graham got saved. The person who did the crusade, all right, called. I mean, they've spent so much of money, so much. Only for one little boy to come out, give his life. And everybody must have thought this is a failure. What, what a waste. Not knowing that that one thing, that one boy was going to be a vessel God was going to use to turn a generation around. Wow. You see, if our understanding is not aligning to the mind of God, if our eyes are not calibrated, we will find ourselves, amen, running and struggling and pursuing things that God has not given to us. And we'll be justifying those things with scriptures. There are people today when they use scripture, they abuse it. They take scripture out of context and use it for their own selfish, but, but the Bible says. You can find the scripture to, 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 you know, to buttress whatever kind of a lifestyle you want to live. That doesn't make it right. A strand of truth is not the truth. Truth is always defined in context. You understand, friends? So, we're tracking this man. I'm just telling you why we're tracking Caleb. We want to finish and finish well. And we're saying this thing is not a contract. It's a covenant. That was why I was trying to emphasize earlier. That this journey is not a contract. It's not a contract of 5, 10 years. There, well, after 40 years, you're free to go and do your own thing. You're free to do whatever you want. No, no, no. There's nothing like that. This is an eternal covenant. They've done away with the old covenant that could not bring the people in. They, we are now living under, amen, yes, a new covenant based and built on the better promises. And this covenant is established, amen, under the nature, the lifestyle of one person. Christ is the pattern. That's why that scripture says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus not on the ministry, not on the man, not on the money, not on the miracle, not on the healing. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and the finisher of your faith. Amen. So we are looking at Caleb. We're finding some principles in Caleb that gives us a sense of understanding of how to occupy right how to occupy till christ's return how to occupy jesus said occupy till i come we we read the the parable of the rich man who was leaving to go possess you know or some transition says to go take a kingdom some says all right to go you know take a position of his kingship and he called his servant gave them all right you know some translation will say 10 talents some translation says, you know, money. But he gave them something. He said, do business till I come. Do business till I come. In other words, engage till I come. You cannot engage the earth if you don't know what has been given to you. You don't know how to manage what has been given to you. 
But it's not enough just to know what has been given to you. There is a construct of a life. This is where, you know, it gets interesting. There's a construct of a life that you must have, that you must imbibe in order to be able to what? Occupy. Because if you don't have that construct of life, even the gift they gave to you, somebody will take it from you. <laughs> if they don't take it from you, you will go and dig the ground and bury it. <laughs> like one of them did. Are you getting it? You will bury it. Because the program of the world system have told you that even with the best of gift in your hand, you are still a slave. You are nobody. You will never amount to anything. Even when you produce the best and you don't know how to market it, how to sell what God has given to you. I mean, that woman, she's got oil in her house. She's got what it takes to settle the debt or the debt, like some people will say, whatever it is. The prophet gave her, he said, go borrow vessels, what it takes to settle the debt so they don't come and take your child is within your house, is within your life. God has deposited all that we need for life and godliness. He's given it to us, but we will see it if we're not if we're not tracking with God. Our eyes of understanding will not be open to see those things. When I was teaching about vision, <clears throat> I, I spoke about four ways we can identify our vision. There are certain people they are born, the day they are born, they know that they are born into you know this thing i mean if you're born into royalty you like it or not that royal blood flows in you the day you are born they are they're already calling you a prince a prince <laughs> you don't need to do anything to know that Emma. yes you know the, the the government of of your nation rests upon your shoulder have you seen children that are kings they have not come of age but then they place them, they, 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 they place somebody, amen, to be watching them, to be building them up, to be training them, how to be a king, but they're already a king. There's some people like that. The environment, amen, has prepared them for the ministry. And it's not just limited to, you know, kings and royalty. There are families because of their sight, because of their sense of understanding, because of their work with God. Before the child is born, they know, they already know what that child would be. We, we saw that with Jesus. We saw that with, you know, with, with, with John the Baptist. We saw that with Samson. They already, they know what that child should be. So, they are not stumbling on life. Like many of us. Our kids grow up, we just send them to school. We don't even know why we're sending them to school. We have no sense of vision for their life. We have no sense of direction for their life. We have no sense of prophetic utterance for their life. You don't. You can't shape your child, amen. In the God placed that child over over your life, amen. You are the you are the shepherd of your children. You are the apostle of your children. You are the pastor. You are the prophet of your children. You are the evangelist shaping how their life, amen, yes, must navigate and move into the intentions of God. You are the teacher of their life. No, no, you abdicate all that responsibility because all you know is just to give back to children. So you give back to children and they become sons of Belia. I have no sense of life. I have no sense of purpose. We have parents that their kids are telling them what to do. Am I communicating? I'm just telling you how we can come into vision. There are those, you know, as they grow in life, you know, doing their own thing, going to university, going to study all kinds of things, just doing their own thing. And they collide with God on the road. Divine providence. So, so why are you persecuting me? Then their life takes a 360 degrees turn around. But they've spent God knows how many years of their life doing the wrong thing. And they will tell you, hello, hello, do you think that, <laughs> do you think that Saul was not passionate about what he was doing? 
Because I hear men of God say, one of the ways to know that, you know, God has called you into this thing is when you have passion. When you have passion. <laughs> oh, God bless Mas Maro. He talked about that. The Mas Maros of this world. I remember. And I remember those, those are the first thing the Lord opened my eyes to see. That as much as this message sounds very wonderful, nice. But there's something that is not right about this message. You cannot anchor on passion alone to discover. I mean, there are people who are highly talented but they are using that talent in the wrong place. See, but the world will tell you, no, how, you to, how to know your vision or your calling is when you have a vision, when you have a drive for that thing. You can have a drive for the, you know, for the wrong thing. In fact, you can have a drive, the right thing, but manifesting the wrong thing. Masmaro preached that the people of the TDJs of this world that we are hearing all kinds of issues happening around them. They preach those things. Where are they today? Where's the message? I told you about that young man in the scripture who, who was highly skilled in running. Nobody can beat him in running. And if he believed that he should be the one to take the message to the king. And they said, it's not you. You are not supposed to take the message. It's not you. He said, but there's nobody as, as good as me. Nobody can run better than me. Yes. Yes, we know you can run. But it's not your call today. So he ran without the message. I'm just showing you the different concept of how we can discover our vision. You can have a giftings. You can have a talent. Yet you have not discovered your vision. Vision is not talent. Vision is not a gift. Vision produces. Vision will enhance a talent and a gift. But vision is not a gift. Vision is not a talent. You see what the Lord is doing? Heaven is calibrating our prophetic sight. You must know what your life is about. It's not, it's not enough to be good in something. What you are using that thing for is the factor. It's what defines vision. Like I said, Saul was highly zealous, persecuting the church, arresting people. He believed 100% that what he was doing was right. To the point that he left his province. He said, let me expand this, this drive. Let's go to Damascus. They said they are Christians in Damascus. Let's go and arrest them. Put them to jail. Both women and children. Put them to jail. They must listen to the Pharisee alone. There's no other church than the Catholic church. There's no other church than <laughs> like any other church. We shut them down. <laughs> that was Saul for you. It was high. In fact, he said, he said, I was zealous. For the, for, the, for the traditions of my fathers. I was zealous. He was highly zealous. He exercised his gift. And he exercised his authority. But on the wrong thing. As he was about to enter Damascus. <laughs> a light shone from heaven. You can read that again. In Act 9. A light. A brilliant light from heaven shone upon him. He hit the ground. The, his, the, the, the horse or mule that he was riding fell. He fell from his horse, fell down. Then he heard the voice, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? His reply was, Who are you, Lord? He was not aware. He has never been aware of the voice of God. But he was raised in a religious, in a churchy environment. He was raised as a good Christian. But he had not collided with God. Some of you, you are in ministry, but you are doing the wrong thing. Because you grow up in, an, in a house of an apostle and they are teaching you all kinds of things. And because the apostle or the prophet is not balanced in the word of God. Don't you understand that what you hear and you continue to hear regularly can change and transform your perspective? And make you even begin to do things. There's an anointing called the anointing of the house. 
if the anointing is not accurate it's not precise it's not rounded it's not Christ based the influence of that anointing that flows from the man of God can, can derail your life It's the same thing with a nation. If the leader of a nation is not vision driven, has no sense of true leadership, is not disciplined, is not focused, has no value, there's a tendency that a majority living in that nation will be behaving like the same head, like the same leader. That's why leadership is very important because leadership influences not just people's behavior, Leadership influences people's thoughts, people's conscience. If you stay with me in the next six months, based on the things that I'm talking about, something about me, hallelujah, will, will patch upon your life. You will begin to see the way I see. You will begin to hear the way I hear. You will begin to enter into certain dimension because that is the power of leadership. It's called influence. So when even God is trying to deliver you from that church, you keep going back there. No wonder you can't hear God. No wonder Samuel cannot, you know, cannot understand what God is saying. They have to take him to Eli. Eli, Eli, the priest God already has rejected. God had to use Eli to give Samuel an interpretation. Oh. <laughs> You see, when, when you speak like this, false leaders will be shaking in their boots because this guy is exposing them. False leadership will be shaking. True leadership will be happy and say, yes, man of God, preach more, talk more on that because his heart is pure. His agendas are pure. But if your agenda is not pure, messages like this, you will be angry at me. But who cares? Because I know I'm speaking the truth. And it's the truth that sets us free at the end of the day. Be, it a, be, you, be you, amen, the prime minister, you need the truth. Be you the governor of a state, you need the truth. Be you, uh, amen, God knows what, you need the truth. You can be an apostle, you need the truth. You can be amen, a teacher. In fact, the apostles and the prophets and the teachers are the ones that need the truth because they are very quick to preach it. But they don't live the life. The days where we just parrot these things are over. We want people who can live the life. Don't you know that sometimes when people leave your church, that is success? That's breakthrough? You see, it's all about perception. When your sight is not corrected, everything you hear that challenges your status quo will become an issue. That person suddenly becomes your enemy. I'm not your enemy. Are you hearing me? I, what I was saying earlier, I said, even if you are in the church, because don't think, well, this is just applied to people who are in the marketplace. It affects every one of us. The place you go, the person who speaks into your life, constantly, continually, influences you when you live in a home where all right your spouse speaks negative never celebrate and honor the grace of god in your life very soon that thing is going to affect you you will start seeing yourself all right as one who is unworthy as one who who has no honor what we say affirms people and if we continue to say those things we can reprogram that's why it's important, it's important that you don't just think about it. You say the right thing to your kids. You say it, you tell them. Say it, let them hear it. You are affirming things. Every time the man of God takes the pulpit and preaches, he's affirming certain things upon your life. You like it or not. Even if even he himself doesn't want to do it. As long as, don't you know that the message a man preaches is an affirmation to the spirit or to spirits. So if you live in an environment and all you hear every day is prosperity, prosperity. What do you think you're going to be hearing? What do you think you're going to be dreaming of? What do you think you're going to be hearing every day? Prosperity. And that's why indeed 
they do prosper financially, materially, but their life is miserable. God is not frowning at our prosper. He wants us to prosper. I want you to prosper. I want to prosper. Because we live in a, in a world that demands that we prosper or else we won't be able to do anything. All the things that I'm talking about requires certain degree amen, of money, material, to fulfill them. But if all, if, if all you're hearing and seeing is about getting things, getting things, you will never hear God. And that's why the devil doesn't mind blessing people he doesn't mind giving you money as long as you cannot hear God as long as amen you don't know what God's intention is for your life he can give didn't he promise Jesus he said you just bow down to me I will give you all the glory of this world that's what he said so when you see those you know you know young you know R&B guys, those guys into music, those guys into hip hop, young young guys. You could say that guy is a millionaire. He's what you know, 30 million. This one, you know, maybe 21, 18 year old. What 40 million? You know, you what this one, what this, and 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 you're like, wow. So music has got money like this. Of course, there's money there, but what do you think they've done? They've sold their soul. The devil, amen, have shut their eyes from their destiny. So he, he has, he has, you know, amplified, you know, their talent or their giftings. Ara, yes, he's given them platform and he's given them a lot of money. And what do they want? They want money. Why? Because they are insecure. They want to. They want. I mean, I see some of those Nigerian artists now. They are all millionaires. You see some of their houses. Some will build an estate. Rich, powerful guys. You understand? But they are all children. All of that money is just about status. Oh, he's got a Lamborghini. He's got this. He's got that. So after all of that, then he's got girls. And he can fly. He's got jet. So after all of that, what else? You see, the spirit that we are dealing with, understand that the real issue has to deal with your soul. So these people don't know. They don't know anything about their soul. I just want to be rich. I just want to be popular. I just want that when I sing on the stage, you know, I'm, I'm invisible and everything. So even if you're singing and your bumps is showing, in fact, that's what they do. You see the girls, they sing, you can almost see their boobs, you know. In fact, they do that deliberately to invite the people. Yes, they almost sing naked. All of that is part of the principle that, you know, that, you know part of the covenant that they've made with the devil. You will sell your body. So issues of value is not is zero, but they have money, and when they come, everybody scream. And you look at that, you think that's success. There's no, there's no better definition of failure than that. And then you also, you think, well, that's the path you want your kids to follow because there's money there. You must be the most the most foolish person on earth. Are, are somebody getting what we're talking about? We need to look at all of this and so we don't fall prey to the lies of the enemy. We're tracking Caleb. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit, and yesterday we were looking at that word, what it, what, what it meant, or what, what it means to have a different spirit. And I remember telling us, let me finish reading, because my servant Caleb has a different, a different spirit and has followed me wholeheartedly. Look at those words. Wholeheartedly. I will bring him into the land he has, he has entered. And his descendants will inherit it. We're dealing with principle of occupation. And I remember yesterday explaining to us that there are two words that define spirit in the scripture. Well, two major words. You have the you have the what you call the pneuma, and you have the 
you have what is also called as the ROAC. The ROAC. The R U A C H. ROAC. All right? They both mean spirit, but their, their objective, amen, differs. When Genesis says, the breath of the God breath into man the breath of life. All right? God breath into man the breath of life. That breath, amen, is pneuma. That is the life of God that comes as a spirit. The life of God is a spirit. All right? God is a spirit. So what God breath into man, amen, is pneuma. But what activates, what gives man the ability, amen, to act as spirit is Roach. I hope you don't get confused. I hope I'm not confusing you. In other words, Roach, amen, is the characteristics. Roach is the characteristics of Numa. You can't see the life of God. You can't see it. But you can see the fruit. You can see the character. You can see the nature. You can see the values. And that word, you know, rock comes from an Hebrew word, amen, that means a wind. A wind. Now, have you seen a wind before? No. Have you felt a wind? Yes. You can't tell, you can't, nobody can tell the color of a wind. The wind, hallelujah, always carry the color of his impact if a wind blows all right in a place where there is dust what you're gonna see amen is dust dust wind but the color of the wind itself you can't see it. the wind takes amen the color the nature of what it impacts if the wind hallelujah if there's a strong wind and that wind you know start you know walking within a place maybe with a lot of trees you see the manifestation of that wind literally uprooting that tree. Or you see the wind, amen, on the sea, on the ocean. It literally carries that water. It's the wind. The wind always takes the nature of the form of its impact. But you don't know the color of a wind. I'm just basically trying to explain that when they say of Caleb that is of a different spirit, how do we know what that spirit is? When the Bible says Caleb has a different spirit, through the conduct, through the character, through the objective, through amen, the persuasion of Caleb, we see the spirit in operation. Just like, amen, this same word, Roa, can also be applied, amen, to an evil spirit. You cannot see an evil spirit, but you can see the manifestation of an evil spirit. When you see somebody possessed by a demon, a demon, demonic spirit, you don't see the demon, but you see the manifestation. And that manifestation tells us, amen, ah, this person is under an influence. And for those who, who have studied, amen, the activity, the work of spirit, they can even identify what kind of spirit that is at work. Back in the days when I used to do deliverance, people who are possessed by, you know, the spirit of lust, I can easily see it. You know, I know I'm dealing with lust here. Those who are possessed with the spirit of anger, I can see it. I know, oh, that's the spirit of anger. People who are possessed with rebellious spirit, you see it. They, they start acting in a particular form or way. You can see it. It's clear. People don't know that you can identify the spirit. Yes. Because spirit takes the form of character. Of human character. That's why you can be very... Not very. You can be spiritual. But if your soul has not come under the control of the influence of the, of the spirit of God. Listen to this. Your soul will become the potter, will become the mouth, amen, of a negative spirit. Your soul become. You see, the soul is not. The soul is not wicked. The soul is not evil. The soul only takes the persona, amen, of the spirit, amen, that controls it. The soul is an expression, amen. Yes, 
The soul, how do you know that you have the spirit of God? If the soul, amen, is not displaying, it's not manifest, manifesting that spirit. That's why the Bible says we need to be, we need to be safe, spirit, soul, and body. When you hear people, when you hear them saying that somebody is carnal, it means that that person, all right, may have the spirit of God to a certain degree, but the soul is so powerful that what the soul does, amen, is that the soul, you know, allows the, a negative spirit to come, all right, and takes over that body, takes over that person's life, all right, yes, to display whatever, even though you are born again, even though the spirit of God is in you, but you have not given the spirit of God, amen, enough grace in enough room you've not allowed the, the holy spirit to take charge of your life to the point that the holy spirit can use your soul use your mind use your thought amen to express his intentions when they say somebody that is sick or right, i should be brought to the you know to the elders and they should lay hands can you lay hands in the spirit amen you need a physical hand amen you need your soul to be coordinating all right if if you are if you're not coordinating, if you're not thinking right, amen, rather than lay hands, you may want to lay your legs. <laughs> are you getting what I'm trying to say? The spirit needs the coordination of the mind. The spirit needs the coordination of your intelligence, your body, amen. Yes, to operate. Jesus stretched what his hand. The hand is now carries that carries the power. The hand is just a man, you know, a, a, a point of contact, a point of contact. You understand? If 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 I say I want to drink water now, I need to open this thing with my hand, with my, you know, with my hands. I can't drink water in the spirit. I said no, no. I want to prove that I'm a spiritual. So, so the the spirit must just lift. Lift, lift the jug, uh, you know, and pour it in my mouth. That's spiritism. That's a different order, and that's what we call spirit. Oh, the, the thing, you know, elevates. People think when somebody, when somebody levitates, rises up, that that is being spiritual. No, those are demonic spirit at work. The spirit of God is an intelligent spirit. They will tell you, leave this place, go to the go to the way Gaza. Why didn't they put an angel there? <laughs> Are you getting what I'm trying to say? I'm ex I'm trying to explain Roach. Roach guides us to to speak in a way that honor God. Guides us to act in a way that glorify God. Amen. Roach defines how we operate, how we govern. Remember the pneuma is in you. The spirit of God is in you. But that spirit is acting out through, amen, the roach. Like, like the translation says here, you know, the word means, amen, yes, to, you know, to express anger, to express, you know, life, to express, you know, it's like to, to take charge, to, you know, to influence the realm. That roar could be a violent spirit. It could be an exaltation. It could be an anger, hallelujah. An extension, amen, into a region or a sky. Roar is a principality. It's a spirit of principality. Oh, God help me. Roar speaks to how to be rational in our thought pattern. It can blast. It can be angry. It can be cool. It can be courageous. I need this point to be clear to you if you're watching me. The spirit led them. That's Roach. See, sometimes we, we get grief in the spirit. We get angry. That's Roach. And sometimes we just express calmness, humility, and all of that. That's Roach. But that Roach is an expression of the spirit of God in you. That rock is still a spirit. But the work of that spirit basically is to act out, to display by this shall men know. That is what we found in who? In Caleb. When the scripture said that Caleb, 
has a different spirit because how do you define that different spirit if there are no actions if there are no you know display how do you know how, when they say somebody is good somebody is righteous the person must act out righteousness when they say somebody is holy you have to see the act of holiness you can't act holy just by being dormant saying nothing doing nothing or be righteous you say nothing you do nothing you act nothing no by their fruit we will know them and that's why I say physical things cannot prove the fruit of what is right or wrong it is the motive it is the action amen it's the value that that complement that physical thing so you cannot just say by their fruit and show people see see what we have done if that becomes how we define what is good or what is wrong we will all be deceived according to the scripture hallelujah but because my servant Caleb has a different spirit what differentiates the spirit of Caleb from the spirit of the rest? The Bible says Caleb and Joshua have a different spirit. What differentiates the spirit of these two from the rest of the ten? They act out what they believe. They act out what, amen. Yes, they know God is able to do in them and through them. We are able to take the land, they said. The other says, we are like grasshoppers before these giants. We are unable we are paralyzed. We are disabled. We don't have what it takes. They were looking at the physical. They saw the fruit of the land. And they concluded. This place is not for us. Is somebody listening to me? The same fruit of the land that Caleb and Joshua saw. And they said. "Ah, This place is so, is so blessed. That this is the right place to be. The others saw it and they saw fear. It all depends on the construct of their spiritual nature. The construct of their spiritual value system. How your spirit manifests in, in a given situation tells us the condition of your spiritual state. Can I tell you something? I said this, I think it was yesterday. We can grow in the spirit. We can build our spirit. What I know today, what, I, what I've come to understand today is far better than what I knew, you know, 20 years ago. There's a growth in my life. There's a growth in, when I say my life, I'm talking about my spiritual life. And for there to be a growth in your spiritual life, you have to be doing certain things that you were not doing 20 years ago. You have to be listening to God. You have to be responding fast and quicker to the things of God. I'm not saying I'm perfect, but I'm just saying that I'm not where I was 20 years ago spiritually. Just like a child that is born, amen, today, in the next 10 years, there should be a difference. As there are differences in the natural, so there are differences in the spirit. If after 20, 20 years or 10 years, you're still behaving the way you were behaving, you know, then something is wrong. That's, that, I mean, that's a, that's a big problem. They say when we ought to be teachers, we are still children. We still need the elementary things. We still need people, te teachers to teach us the elementary. When we ought to have become teachers, we grow in the things of God. Our spirit grows. The spirit of Caleb was a mature spirit until we come to the full stature of Christ. The full stature of Christ is a spiritual status. The full stature of Christ is a spiritual status. It's not the physical we think we possess. We grow in stature until we come to the full stature of Christ. We come to the telios. Christ is a son, but he's a full son. 
is the mature son. Today you have become my son. Today, the father said. You see, if you've been tracking us, the things that we are saying will make you grow. That you may grow thereby. There are certain ministries that will not commit into your hands until you grow to certain height in the spirit. Even if you know that that is your calling, they will not bring you into it because they will not allow you amen, to jeopardize, to use your immaturity to jeopardize a ministry that requires to be handled amen, with maturity and sensitivity. They say, yes, it's your calling to do that thing, but you are not mature enough. You've not come of age. I'm just dealing with that simple statement that Caleb had a different spirit and we're tracking what that different spirit is or means. The things that will cause others, you know, to compromise, to lie, you know, to fight, to be angry. When Caleb gets there, doesn't move him. Very good example. You can't bribe him. You can't talk him out of. But let's quickly look at some points because I really want to quickly finish this today so we can maybe move on to the next thing. I've got some few points. I remember yesterday I said you must remind me of some of these points that we can look at the highlight, the character quality, if you will, the spiritual nature, the spiritual value system, the leadership spirit of Caleb, because it takes a leadership spirit to get to the point where you are not judged by time, where in fact your life is enhanced by time. All right. So let's quickly run through this. I, I'm, I'm not. I, I might not explain everything because of time. The first thing that we're going to look at is self-belief. And to have self-belief, you must believe in God. There's no self-belief without believing in God. Because self-belief basically is self-identity. A man that they had to deal with his identity before they sent him out was who? Gideon. Gideon. Gideon did not know who he is. Just like so many people that God used in the scripture, the first thing God deals with when he calls us, he calibrates our sight and it changes our identity by changing our name. There is no person that God sent out, amen, leaving them in their old nature. There is no person that God uses, amen, yes, by leaving them intact with their old nature. The first thing God does, he engages their character. He engages their belief system. He engages their philosophy. He engages the value system of their life. He engages their perception. When I was explaining about how to understand vision, how to know your vision, I didn't mention the last one. I, I spoke about three. The last one is, there are certain places we get to with God that God starts asking us certain questions to trigger, to trigger amen, us to think or to enter into certain position of inquiry. And we saw that with Peter. I mean, Peter was following Jesus, but Peter didn't know who, what, who he was and what amen, he was called to do. In fact, we all know Peter as what? A fisherman. That was his occupation. But what God designed for Peter before the foundation of time was for him to become fishers of men. So was fishing wrong? No, fishing wasn't wrong. In fact, he needed to fish. He needed a skill of fishing. All right. Until the day he collided with God. And so, Peter and the rest were walking with the Lord. They went to a place called uh, uh, Caesarea Philippi. The Bible says uh, they were about to enter the gate of Caesarea Philippi. Jesus halted and he asked a question. Who do men say the son of man is? And you know Jesus don't ask questions because he just need to ask a question. For every question, there's a context and there's a reason. 
he answered that he asked that question as he was about to enter because Caesarea Philippi was a city of great philosophers. The other said, because Caesarea Philippi was a city of great philosophers, great thinkers. It's a part city. But people gather from different parts of the world to sit and debate about all kinds of philosophy. So when he got there, he had to ask that question. It was strategic. Who do men say the Son of Man is? Because he was going to be engaging with the, with the ruling philosophy. With the psyche of men. And they say, well, some say you are Elijah. Some say you are Jeremiah. Some say you are one of the prophets. You know, you know, the, he's getting a feedback. Jesus is getting a feedback of, you know, the general belief of, of who they think he is. So after Jesus have heard the feedback of what people think or say about him, he turned to his own disciple. He wanted to compare and contrast. That, okay, you guys, you you have proximity. You've been following me. Who do you say the Son of Man is? He asks his own disciples. I mean, why Jesus? Why would you ask such a question to your disciples? They should know who you are. They've been following you. Ah, you can be following and still, amen, be following blindly. You can be attending a church and still don't know why you're attending a church. You can be married and still don't know why you're married. You can be in a relationship and still don't know why you're in a relationship because you are in that thing for all kinds of reasons, but not the true reason. So Jesus, hallelujah, threw the question directly to them. Who do you say that I am? I can imagine Mark going, nobody knows except one. Peter say you are you are the Messiah, you are Christ the Messiah the son of the living God yo like they will say here yo <laughs> Peter say you are Christ the Messiah the son of the living God Jesus looked at him and said Certainly, that did not come from your brain. That didn't come from, you know, the school you went. That didn't come from, you know, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. But my Father in heaven, and I say to you, that's the point. Can you see? The revelation of Christ can reveal our own true identity. In fact, the only way we get to know Christ, where we get to know ourselves, excuse me, is when we know Christ. You don't know who you truly are until you know Christ. I didn't say no church. I didn't say know the pastor. I didn't say just know the Bible. I didn't say just know how to pray. I say you know Christ. When you know Christ, not only will you know yourself, you will know people and you will know things. You will know everything. And I say to you, you are a solid, massive rock and not a pebble. I say to you, you are Peter, son of Bajona. And on this revelation, on this utterance, on this knowledge, I will build my church. Ah. And the gates of Hades will not prevail. Can you see the principle Jesus established? The issues of identity. Because I've said all of that to buttress, lest you say self awareness. And you think I'm talking about humanistic concept no when you are aware of who Christ is you become aware of yourself and that was what gave David the upper hand he was aware amen of himself because he was aware of God and he looked at that thing and said you today you're coming down who Goliath should have run away because you know 
somebody at his height can be saying things like that with such a confidence and he's still there say i mean goliath of course is human he's fleshy he's looking at david and saying you you this rat you this i'm just gonna raise my head and <laughs> he met his maker that day <laughs> so physical condition does not define our true state or status Are you with me, friends? The first thing that we saw in the character nature and the quality character of Caleb is self-belief. Visionary people have this power of self-awareness. They are very confident of who they are in God, not who they are in the world. Quickly go to the next one. I can't explain much, but you get the picture. The second one is resilient. First one, self, you know, self-aware, self-belief. The second one is resilient. They are resilient, no matter the situation, no matter the circumstance. You beat them, you hit them, you you do whatever. They bounce back. It's like they never die. Why? Because the vision never dies. I, I've told us before that what sustains us is our vision. Anything that is not done in vision has no sustenance capacity or capability. Anything that is not done with vision, that is not carried out in vision, including our relationship, it will die naturally. Vision is the power to sustain. And vision does not come from you. You don't get vision, amen, from school. You don't get vision because there's a need in the community. Vision comes from God. I am not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Resilient. You must be resilient. No matter what you go through, the pain of your past, the traumas, does not stop you from remaining and advancing to us the place of fulfilling or occupying what God has called you to occupy. You are resilient. I said, can't this guy just die? Can't you just give up? No. No. Because they are people of faith. Faith never dies. Hallelujah. I'm just giving you all this point quickly. And then I'll be done for this morning. Not after the issue we went through the first time. The third point we find, alright, in this character quality, in this spirit of Caleb, is passion. I made a statement yesterday. It's a lot of people, you know, are liking you know, desire to be passion. Desire and passion are not the same thing. No matter how strong your desire is, if, if that thing does not pass the threshold to passion, something will, will quench it. That desire can, you know, can be quenched. I was thinking about this concept yesterday. In the temple, one of the things we see in the temple that defines that the temple is alive is light. Remember the menorah where you have the candles. The menorah. They said the, the fire must not go off. The fire must burn day and night. And then another thing we see that reflects fire in the temple is the altar. They said the fire in the altar must not go off. It must burn day and night. You remove the ashes of yesterday, amen, and you bring fresh wood. The fire must continue. Those are one of the concepts, excuse me, that we get to know that a house is alive. A human being is alive. You burn with fire. Fire, amen, is an expression of passion. It goes beyond just a desire. 
You can have a desire and after a while the desire will, will die down. The difference between ambition and vision is passion. People who are very ambitious, they have desire. And they do a lot of things. But after a while, if it's an ambition, they can't pass certain threshold. They begin to die. They begin to nose dive. But if it's a vision, it burns with passion. Hundred years, they are still going. And you see that it took vision for Noah to be able to build the ark. Vision never dies. That's why vision outlives even the visionaire. Because vision is from God. Anything that is of God, that is from God, is eternal by nature. It has that eternal nature. It has that capacity of immortality. It's self-sustaining. So, there's self-awareness, self-belief, there's resilience, there's passion. You can take everything from them. Their house can burn. They can lose their business. They can lose family. They can lose so many things. They don't lose the vision. You can't explain it. That thing just keep burning. The fire never dies. The oil, hallelujah, is forever flowing. Keeping, amen, that, that fire burning. That's number three. Let's do four and then maybe we'll, we'll, we'll just wrap up for, you know, for the day. Number four is empathy. Empathy. Not sympathy. Empathy. I'm not talking about sympathy. It's empathy. Visionary people, people like Caleb, all right, empathize with people. They seek to help people. They seek to improve. They seek to lift people up. They always see the best of others. They strive to improve the life of people, wherever they, wherever they are. You don't see them say, I'm, I'm here, I've arrived. You know, you know, there are certain people, when they walk into a room or into a place, everybody knows they're around because, you know, of the attitude. They are loud. Even if they don't say anything, their body structure tells you they are loud. Don't talk to me. I'm in charge here. I'm in control. They are very domineering. They think they know better than others. They can't relate with people of low estate. They have this, you know, attitude of entitlement. Their Bible must be carried for those who are men of God, so-called men of God. Entourage must follow them. They, they always make the opportunity to make a statement wherever they are. And the statement is always, uh, is always like, look at me. Everything they do is about, you've got to respect me. Those are the most insecure people. Those are the most damaged people. Because they believe that they have to do something, get something, have something. To prove that they are better off. They have no empathy. They talk to their workers. To their maids. Maids. Like as if they are nothing. They think their gift or their talent. Or even their calling. Their big man. Big man reason ministry. Is what makes them. Honorable. They have no honor. They have no sense of the inner drive that help them to see things the way things are. They're full of themselves. The eye in them is very tall, 
No wonder they live in sin. Because it's always about me. It's always about them. Empathy is very important. Empathy is what allows us to see the need to do certain things, to remain in a certain place, to visit certain people, to talk in a certain way that gives people you know, a sense of importance, a sense of hope, a sense of vision, a sense of direction. Even when people don't believe in themselves, people have empathy when they come around you. They make you believe in yourself. I'll stop here. So much has been said this morning. What are we doing? We are tracking. <coughs> Dynamics of the kingdom. Today's part 10. And we're looking at Caleb's paradigm. As we understand what it means to occupy till Christ come. Are you seeing that the idea of occupying first speaks to our structure, our state and status as humans in Christ. This is very important. And of course, all what we're talking about are prophetic. That's why some of the things we highlight, amen, deals with areas in our life that we will not naturally speak about. God wants us to understand these things. And live within the context of this prophetic understanding. Because it will build us. It will sanctify us. It will give us a sense of readiness and importance. Strategic occupation, friends. Well, I hope this morning that you have been enriched by this point. Once again, let me apologize for our first you know broadcast i don't know what happened the computer just froze everything just went still so i had to shut down the whole thing and start again but we thank god that we, we were able to you know do something a little with the rest of time god gave to us i, I want to believe that you have been impacted you have been enriched you've been you know edify because that's my intention my desire is to see that everyone gets built up so we can fulfill God's purpose for our life. But to do that, we must know how to occupy. So we'll continue, hopefully, tomorrow or Sunday as the Spirit of the Lord will direct. So thank you, everyone, once again. Thank you for joining this morning. My gratitude and appreciation to every one of you. Thank you for all our regular listeners. I want to thank you for being part of you know, this journey. God is leading us. We're going somewhere and we're going to continue to do what the Spirit of God will allow us to do. Come next year. We believe in God for great things next year. If you want to join, be part of, you know, our, um, our mentorship school, you want me to mentor you, you need to reach out to me. All right. That's, that's how it goes. You have to send a message to me that I would like to, you know, to be mentored. You know, I want to understand certain things, you know, about what life is all about, ministry and all of that, yes. So we give you the opportunity to do that. And we're also thinking of starting our prophetic school again next year. We just allow the Lord to lead us. No pressure, but just allowing the Spirit of God to guide us. So we'll see you again, friends. Thank you once again for being part of this live broadcast. God bless you. Continue to rejoice in the Lord. Let the will of God continue to enrich your life. Be empowered. We'll see you again. Bye-bye.